Alright, so now I'm going to get down to the second part of the lecture on gram-positive cocci, and this part we're only going to be going over the streptococcus. So first we're going to go over the overview. Um, streptococcal species obviously have a name, but they can also be categorized by the C-carbohydrate, which is also called the Lance Field Group, which is located on their cell wall. The step one will require you to know both of these. So we're going to go down the list. Streptococcus pyogenes, which is known for causing strep throat or pharyngitis, is a group A streptococcus. Streptococcus A galactici is a group B streptococcus, and this is the number one cause of neonatal meningitis. Enterococcus and streptococcus, this is supposed to be bovis, I'm sorry, that's supposed to be a V, is a group D streptococcus and uh, streptococcus pneumonia and varied and strep do not fall into this category. And this is all the bacteria that we're going to be going over, but streptococcus pneumoniae and streptococcus pyogenes is the most important high yield. As a side note, please remember that all strep are catalase negative. Why is this important? Because this is how we distinguish between strep and staph biochemically. So first we're gonna go over the virulence factors. The first and most important is something called M protein. And this determines the type of group A beta hemolytic streptococci, which is the streptococcus pyogenes. It is antiphagocytic, so it prevents it from being uh, digested by uh, the phagocytes in your body. And this is what antibodies can respond to. Antibodies respond to two things when it comes to strep, the M protein and streptolysin O, which by the way, I should make this clear that both of these are only found in beta hemolytic, specifically the S pyogenes. Um, the M protein is very important because it's what causes the rheumatoid fever and acute glomerulonephritis. glomerulonephritis. So as a recap, M protein, most important virulence factor, prevents it's antiphagocytic and it is what can cause rheumatoid fever and acute glomerulonephritis by cross-reacting with the antibodies. We'll get into that later though. Another very important point is that they contain capsules, and this is especially important, especially, especially important for S. pneumoniae. This is S. pneumoniae's number one virulence factor. If you associate S. pneumoniae with anything, please associate it with a capsule. Erythrogenic toxin causes scarlet fever, and this is a super antigen. What's a super antigen again? We discussed this with the S. aureus, super antigens attached to MHC2 and T cell receptors, and they cause immune response by increasing IL-1, IL-2, and tumor necrosis factor. The erythrogenic toxin causes scarlet fever. This is specific to streptococcus pyogenes. Streptolysin O. The O here stands for oxygen. Streptolysin O is inactivated by oxygen. Also, this is what causes the beta hemolysis. It lyses the blood cells in the blood auger, and it is antigenic. This is clinically important because we can measure ASO, streptolysin O, to look for infection. Streptolysin S, not as relevant, not inactivated by oxygen. This is not as important. Pyogenic exotoxin A causes toxic shock syndrome. This is very, very similar to the toxic shock syndrome as S. aureus, but there's a few differences that we'll get over in the next page. Exotoxin P causes necrotizing fasciitis. This isn't as important. And then uh, it produces hyaluronidase. It produces streptokinase, which is an anticoagulant that's still used today, and DNase. As a side note, I want to get this over with, that any organism that can cause meningitis will almost always have a capsule. And there's been tons of questions that will say, blah, 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 this patient has meningitis, blah, 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 what is the virulence factor associated? You don't necessarily need to know which bacteria is causing it. All you need to know is that if it is a bacteria, the, the uh, virulence factor is going to be a capsule all the time. Capsules are vital for meningitis. Secondly, if something has a capsule, it has a positive quelling reaction. They can give this to you or they can say blah, 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 has meningitis. What do you expect? Gram-positive organism that has a positive quelling reaction. So it's important to associate meningitis with a capsule and a positive quelling reaction. 
So now we're going to go over streptococcus pyogenes. This causes lots of different stuff, pharyngitis, also known as strep throat, scarlet fever, toxic shock syndrome, rheumatic fever, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. I didn't list it here because I don't think it's very important, but skin infections. Pharyngitis, you want to treat this immediately to prevent rheumatic fever, glomerulonephritis, or progression to otitis media or sinusitis. Pharyngitis is also strep throat. Someone comes in with a very, very sore throat, and I'll show this on the next page. You can see the exudate in the back of their throat. You should start them on antibiotics immediately to prevent the progression to rheumatic fever or glomerulonephritis. Scarlet fever is very unique to Streptococcus pyogenes. It has a strawberry tongue that I'll show on the next slide, and it's caused by the erythrogenic toxin. It causes a fever and a red rash that peels. It's almost a less severe form of toxic shock syndrome, which you see here. This toxic shock syndrome is very, is very similar to the one of S. aureus, except two exceptions. First, you can see the pharyngitis, or you can see the skin infections that can cause a toxic shock syndrome. And second, positive blood cultures. S. aureus does not have positive blood cultures, and you cannot see the infection a lot of the time. Skin infections. Um, it can cause glomerulonephritis by having immune complexes de deposit in the glomerular membrane. This is, uh, this is more pathology. Um, you'll get symptoms of kidney disease, such as edema. Uh, rheumatic fever causes cross-reacting of the antibodies and damage causes endocarditis in the aortic and mitral valves mostly. This is different from the endocarditis caused by drug users with S. aureus infections because S. aureus usually infects a tricuspid valve because bacteria travels from the veins to the vena cava into the right atrium. It also causes damage to joint and brain tissue, and here you see chorea. Chorea are spastic dance-like movements that are its not specific to rheumatic fever, but you will see it in rheumatic fever. This is a strawberry tongue, and as you can see here, here's the uh, exudate, and this stuff right here is S. pyogenes and this shows strep throat slash pharyngitis. The other bacteria that are not as high yield are S. a. galacticate. This is kind of high yield because this is the number one cause of neonatal meningitis. Remember it causes meningitis. If it causes meningitis it has a capsule. It's part of the normal floor of the vagina which is why during pregnancy when the mother is delivering the baby she can contaminate the baby or infect the baby with the S. a. galacticate and the baby will develop meningitis. That's why this is the number one cause of neonatal meningitis. Viridin streptococci are uh, bacteria that, are, uh, that inhabit the mouth or the normal floor of the mouth and they're usually associated with an invasive dental surgery that'll open up uh, it'll cause a wound in your mouth that will open up the bacteria to be able to enter the bloodstream and therefore they can cause endocarditis this is the most common cause of endocarditis and dentists used to give prophylaxis before dental surgery with antibiotics to prevent this from happening so think of these like streptococcus mutants or sanguis with endocarditis and they can also cause lung and brain abscesses as well. And once again, this is more of a pathology issue. Enterococci and Streptococcus bovis. Um, Enterococci is very important. It causes hospital-acquired UTIs or urinary tract infections due to catheters. But it can also cause endocarditis. So you need to differentiate this from, um, from the other strep organisms. Streptococcus bovis, it's a bacteria found in your gut. If you get colon cancer, you can get uh, endocarditis caused by this bacteria. And once again, you need to know how to differentiate all the different types of streptococci when it comes to endocarditis. And I have a table showing you that at the end. Streptococcus pneumoniae, this is very, very high yield, very important. It's called pneumococcus. Uh, it's the most common cause of community-acquired pneumonia, meningitis, otitis media, and sinusitis. So this is a very important uh, organism. Remember, it causes meningitis. If it causes meningitis, it has a capsule. If it has a capsule, it has a positive coiling reaction. Very important. Um, on slides, gram stains, you see it as a diplococci, which means it'll basically be two circles joined together. It's alpha hemolytic. 
And as a side note, it contains something called C substance, which doesn't really add to its virulence factor, but it can react with a protein from the liver called the C-reactive protein. The CRP is used clinically to estimate the risk of heart attack, and studies have shown that the CRP is actually more effective in predicting heart attacks than cholesterol. Um, splenectomy, whenever you remove your spleen, you have a higher risk of chance of infection from all encapsulated organisms, including streptococcus pneumoniae. And uh, there's also a polysaccharide vaccine available that comes from its capsule. That's given to older patients, usually above the age of 65. There's also a conjugated vaccine that's combined with diphtheria that's given to children. This actually lowers the rate of streptococcus pneumonia in adults because the children can no longer get it and therefore they cannot transfer it to older people. Right here you can see examples of diplococci. There's one, one. They're all over the place here. Look at that. And this is probably the most important thing that you will see in this lecture is this table. This is something that you need to learn. It's going to be a pain in the ass, but once you learn it, it'll be your time. Hemolysis, strep, uh, pyogenes, group A, group B, streptococcus are both beta hemolytic. Enterococcus and streptococcus bovis are not as important. They vary. Streptococcus pneumonia is alpha. Viridin is alpha. Um, here you'll see several different antibiotics. The way I like to remember it is when you compare Streptococcus pyogenes to A. galactici, I think Streptococcus pyogenes is more important. It's more high yield. And for some reason, I'm telling you this trend always happens. Whenever something is more high yield, it tends to be more sensitive to the antibiotic that diagnoses it. For example, this case, Streptococcus pyogenes is sensitive to bacitracin. In this case, Streptococcus pneumoniae is inhibited, more sensitive to optotoken or optoken. And if you went back to the staph chapter, Staphylococcus epidermidis was more sensitive to novobiosin than um, than anything else. So. Uh, and this shouldn't be too tough to remember. Enterococcus is a very, very resilient bacteria. It's very important in hospitals, and it's very hard to kill with antibiotics. So you can imagine that it'll grow in 6.5% NACL, whereas Streptococcus bovis won't. And for treatment, the staph produce beta-lactamase, but the strep do not produce beta-lactamase, so they're usually susceptible to penicillin medications, like amoxicillin or penicillin B. And just like S. aureus, if a patient is allergic to the penicillin's macrolides, such as erythromycin, do work. This is a, an important point. Most resistance to antibiotics for bacteria comes from plasmids from conjugation, where one bacteria will transfer plasmid to another bacteria. In Streptococcus pneumoniae, and this is actually a board-relevant question, or a high-yield fact, that S. pneumoniae resistance comes from transformation. This is when a bacterial lysis, where it kind of explodes, the membrane dissociates, the DNA leaks out. Other bacteria can pick up that DNA and encode what was on it. If they pick up a piece of the DNA that has the antibiotic resistance, then they will become resistant. And Streptococcus pneumoniae is one of the bacteria that does this. And that concludes the gram-positive cocci.